This is the sixth in a series of idea forums that we've had over the past couple of years in which we've picked an important public policy issue, gotten a venue. Tonight we're, particip we're uh, partnering with the Loyola School of Communication. We thank them for sharing their facility. They've been wonderful partners in a variety of projects. And then we bring together people who know the subject and we invite an audience and we try to discuss reasonably and civilly and intelligently an important public policy issue. We looked at privatization, at TIFs, at term limits, at the gaming bill, at the value of townships, and now we're looking at public pensions, which of course have been described as the ticking time bomb of Illinois government. Issue by issue, we're going to bring people together and experts together because only by a transparent dialogue are we going to create the sense of change that's in the air. You know change is in the air in Illinois. Uh, a lot of groups and a lot of news organizations, even in this time of diminished media, are paying close attention to these important issues. And so that's why it's, glad to be, it's, it's, it's gratifying to be a small player in this overall discussion about how to really create the state of Illinois that we can be proud of after this nightmare of Ryan and Blagojevich and so many others, um, problems here in Chicago at Cook County. Things are improving. I'm optimistic, but this pension crisis still represents the single biggest financial challenge for us. With that as a backdrop, um, it's a privilege to be doing this. Thank you all for coming, and I'll turn it over to my, to my friend and former colleague, Charles Thomas of ABC7. Thanks. I think all of us know enough about the pension crisis that we know what the central questions are, and this isn't the only central question, but it's certainly one of the central questions. And I'm going to start with Mr. Fainer. What are the limits to pension reform? How far can the legislature go? Andy talked about that sentence as being one example, but how far can the legislature go in terms of pension reform? What are the limits? Where must we stop because of the state constitution? Well, well First of all, there's a substantial disagreement, uh, so I'm going to give you my views backed up by... I would like to hear your views. My views are the only limits are that you may not take anything that's already been earned from any member of the pension. I, I think that uh, to do so, uh, even though that's currently being discussed, uh, you're going back uh, on COLAs or something else, I think that would be uh, inappropriate slash unconstitutional. I think that... Going forward, as long as you freeze what has been earned, bought, and paid for, so to speak, uh, the uh, opportunities for change for setting the pensions on a proper course are uh, very, very broad. Uh, but the, the important thing, as a lawyer, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but I certainly consult with a lot of them, uh, is that is that whatever whatever is done has to. Uh, meet several tests, and, and it's not revolving around that one sentence, because like everything in law, it's not that simple. So, I mean, I don't know if I put it clearly or, or haven't put it clearly. Is it on? Yeah, I can just, yeah, I can talk about her. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are no limits except you. I don't believe you can claw back. I think you can make arrangements to do something that's fair going forward. Um, the permutations and combinations could be substantial on that basis. M Mr. Bayer, I know that you have some strong feelings about what can not be done. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you could share those with us now. Well, uh, we believe uh, what can't be done is you can't reduce the benefits uh, for any current participant uh, in a public pension plan in Illinois. So they can do it for new hires, as they did, uh, in my view, mistakenly, what they did, but I had no question about the constitutionality that they passed a law that said effective January 1st, 2011, anybody hired after that date coming into a pension system uh, is going to have a new level of benefits. In my view, they cannot reduce the benefits uh, for any current participant. And I'm, that, I'm not a lawyer. And, and that, would include, that would include COLAs? That would include COLA. It says the benefits of which shall not, an enforceable contractual relationship, the benefits of which shall not be diminished or impaired. That's what the Constitution says. Uh, there has been, there was a long, extensive debate at the time of the, 
of the Constitutional Convention in 1970. I wasn't there, but uh, I've read portions of that debate. I've read uh, the brief that was done by Eric Medeer, the chief counsel for the Senate President John Cullerton, uh, who says, in his view, it's a contractual relationship that uh, can't uh, that can't be and benefits can't be diminished uh, or impaired. Uh, there's court precedent uh, that says uh, you can't do that. Uh, there have been uh, individual cases where the laws had changed after someone uh, had become a participant in the plan and when the person went to uh, collect their benefits, uh, they try to pay, give them the reduced benefits based upon the new law and the courts ruled no, you have to pay the person according to the benefits as they were uh, when uh, he was initially hired. So I do not believe that they can be reduced. Uh, Representative Neckwitz and, and also Representative Sanger, there have been discussions. I would assume that you've, in your meetings, that this has come up. It's, it's been a, 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 has this been a central part of your discussions? How far can you go legislatively in terms of developing a framework well, there's certainly been some discussion about it, Charles, but I, it's not, I would not say it's been central to our discussions because I, ultimately that's not a decision that we can make in that room. It's a decision that the Supreme Court will have to make, and we have to make our, our best educated and, and, and use our best judgment about what can be done. Um, I would say that I think, from my view, ultimately this is a balancing act, just like everything else we do in government is. Um, we have constitutional obligations to fund education, very clear in the Constitution that, that about what we're supposed to do, and I don't think anybody would argue we come even close to that. We have constitutional obligations to fund the health and welfare of the state of people of, and of the people of the state of Illinois, um, and and so we we ultimately, and I believe the Supreme Court ultimately has to balance all those constitutional mm -hmm. obligations that the state has as well. Uh, Representative Singer, is is this worth going to court? Uh, to, to, have you have you had any discussions in your work group on? Uh, just just the, 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 the positives and negatives of litigation. Is this something that needs to be litigated? Do we need to take it to the courts um, to find out exactly how far we can go with pension reform? You, you know, it's, it's, that's a good question. And there has been, between uh, Senate Bill 512, which we were working on before, and what we're working on now, the governor's work group, um, basically what 512 was saying is that, you know, this was not unconstitutional because we weren't taking current benefits away and we're asking people to have a choice to go into a um, 401k. In our work group that we're working with now, it's a little different, um, and I'm not a, a constitutional lawyer and it change your form either, but it, we're working more on offering consideration. So th those discussions are being had. But the bottom line is, is it you know, worth the while going to court or not? Everybody keeps saying it's gonna go to court no matter what. Um, but we have tools in our pocket that we can work and figure this stuff out. So that's that's our bottom line on the whole thing. There's a lot of choices here. We need to really sit down and say what can work. Um, taking, you know, there every time we delay a solution, it gets more costly. So if we, that's the only concern I have. If it goes to courts and it takes a long time, it could, it could land up hurting us even more. Ch chime right in. Yeah, I, if, we if want if you I guys might, to I mean, talk think, to each you know, other. I think that we've gotten this whole discussion, beginning with Andy's remarks and, and your question posed to us, off on the wrong foot. We're here to talk about pension reform. Uh, and so far, we've only talked about can we cut benefits and how much does it cost to cut those benefits. And I don't think the problem that we have here in Illinois stems from overly generous pension benefits. And I, I'd like just a, a couple of facts that I would like uh, to make sure everybody understands. The average public pension in, for all retirees in Illinois is $32,000 a year. Now, that's not a bad pension, but when you consider that 85% of those people who get that pension get no Social Security. The, em, their employers don't pay in the Social Security, uh, and, of course, they don't pay into Social Security either. However, on the other hand, they all pay, and this is something else I think a lot of people don't understand, that every public employee who participates in a public pension plan pays in each paycheck. Part of their paycheck goes to the pension plan. They don't have any discretion about that. It's, and, you know, for many of them who are not covered by Social Security, it's 8.5% of their page, of every one of their paychecks goes into their pension plan. 
Uh, for those who are covered by Social Security, they have not only Social Security taken out, but they have uh, uh, money taken out as well to go into their pension plan. So the problem we're talking about, you know, or you're talking about cutting benefits and can we cut benefits, and we should be talking about real reform. The real problem that we have with pensions here in Illinois is the fact, and it, it, was, it was mentioned, in fairness, that in the past, public bodies had not paid the actuarially required amounts in order to keep the pension plans fully funded. Now, and that's why we, but none of the bills, either the bill that passed uh, for new hires, there was no pension reform in that. There was nothing in that bill that required employers going forward to make their payments. As a matter of fact, how many people here live in the city of Chicago? I do. Does it raise your hands live in the city of Chicago? Well, for all of us, that so-called reform bill, that's going to cost us a billion dollars over the next 30 years because part of that bill that passed cutting benefits also cut payments to the Chicago Public Teachers Pension Fund. And because those payments were not made into the pension fund, that over the course of 30 years, according to the pension fund, it's going to be a, a billion dollars more for those of us who pay property taxes here in the city. 512, which is a bill that's, that's, uh, that was, I think it was passed out of the House, and uh, the Civic Committee uh, uh, also uh, was uh, in favor of that bill, supported that bill. That bill would also accentuate the problem because that bill freezes the amount that the city would pay in to the pension plans going forward to the municipal fund and the laborers fund. But Mr. So Bayer, that, that can too it, would, let me just finish. But, that would prepare, what we need is reform. We need something like the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, which covers all of the downstate local governments, the cities and the counties. Those employers have to pay every year, they have to pay the actually required amount. We don't have to talk about that. They were 100% funded before the market <clears throat> crash. They're, like everybody else, their assets went down, but they're still in relatively yep. good shape. And thanks to them, we have... Henry, let's make bill. our point and let, let's, okay. let's move on because well, we have other people on the panel here. We need here. reform, and what the reform should be, we need to require that, whether it be the city of Chicago, Cook County, or the state of Illinois, to make the actuarially required payments to the pension plan. Without that, there is no reform. It's just a lot of talk, and it's just cutting benefits. That's all it is. Well, it's not well, reform. We, we, you know, we have... We, you know, I, I, I would... I don't think anybody would dispute the $32,000 a year average, but in aggregate, the problem that doesn't make the I problem... Would. I would. I would. Yeah. I would. <laughs> Go for it. Well, first of all, Henry, the one thing we always agree on uh, is that the members of the pensions, the members of the pensions uh, have paid in their part of the bargain every single time, and, and it's not their problem. They didn't create the problem. It's a better way to put it. It is their problem. But the $31,000 uh, is not an act, actual or a real number because that averages, and it takes in people who did it for a short time or and then left, and I can, you know, if, if we evolve into this this evening, um, I'll show my charts, he'll show his, except I didn't bring mine along. It's $61,000 is the average throughout the state, number one. You can accept, Henry gives me, and that's not a lot of money for people who've worked all over that. That's not my point. It's not 31. Number two, uh, the city has a whole different set of problems than, uh, and, and than the, the rest of the state because they do things differently in the city, as we all know. Uh, and I could break that out for you, too. Uh, but the thing that Henry has not talked about he, we, we, is nobody's talked about the $80 billion of, of upside down and how do you pay for that. It isn't just, you know, it isn't let's we're just talking about cutting benefits. What was done in Rhode Island uh, that uh, everyone seems to admire, I think most of us do anyway, and, and the treasurer came and spoke about it, she was able to carry a message and said, I'm a Democrat in a democratically controlled state except for Republican governor. The governor tried for 10 years and couldn't get it done. He said, I'll stay out of the way. So the messenger was a Democrat. She identified, as has been done recently the last few days in Illinois, what some real numbers are. I mean, we fought over whether last year there wasn't a problem. Um, I was told that we've never missed a pension payment. I was told that by, we were all told that, I don't mean me. Uh, by various bodies, 
And Mr. Ingram, who's in the, the audience tonight, who's the executive director of TRS, like Henry, they must grow him good there. He came from New Hampshire. And he said, look, I've got fiduciary obligations to my members, which are the teachers in the state, the IEA and so forth, <laughs> IFT. And we're, we're, we're in bad shape. We're not funded. And we will be bankrupt or out of money in a relatively short period of time. So we spent a lot of time just getting to the fact to admit almost a year that we have a problem. I'm with Henry. It has to be a solution. It should not be at the expense of the union members because they've kept their part of the bargain. But there has to be a solution. It involves, uh, you know, some sort of, as Romando from New Hampshire, or, uh, Rhode, Island. Rhode Island said, uh, you know, there should be some shared sacrifice. Why? Because, we, it's like, is here. She said, we have, there is a constitutional provision. You can't change it. And I told my members, that's great. If we can't change it, what do we do when there's no money? Then we can say they can't change it. If there's no money, we don't have pensions. We have a similar thing here. We have to look at getting beyond that and doing some shared sacrifice. And why, why should the public pensions uh, share the, the, the problem? Well, because the 95 percent of us that are not in the public pension union, we, didn't, we don't get the pension. We didn't pay in. But we're, we have to pay those pensions, and we have to pay the $80 billion that, that has to be amortized and paid. So we're all stakeholders, is the point. Uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Representative Singer. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. And this, Henry, we've been sitting next to each other for many hours now debating some of the same things. But any time we get out statistic and we start uh, debating the numbers, we're failing to do what we really have to do, which is work together and kind of come up with a solution. Um, I know there's a lot of talk about the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, and it was my understanding, you made the quote about the average was 32,000. I think IMRF is 11,000 is their pension payment. And I know they've done a real good job making sure the cost of that system stays intact. They also do a good job of making sure it, it is actually calculated every year, and they also make sure that their discount rate assumption is, is 7 point, I believe, 5 percent, even though they make rates of return of 8.2 percent. So they're doing things right for a lot of reasons. It's a good model to follow. But we need to get out of the debate on, you know, what's this number, what's that number. We, we have a system that is failing, and we're here trying to make sure that you have something to retire on if you're in the system.